Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to day four. As we take off on phase two of the passenger journey, pre-departure and arrival. Thank you for being here this morning. We're still dribbling in, but we thought we'd get started. In any case, we do have a bit of competition. It was the official opening of the Jazz Festival last night, so mm, maybe some people are still waking up a bit, but I'm sure they'll be here. And we have a wonderful sunshine, wonderful day. So we'll try to keep it to time this morning and make sure you can leave the building on the allotted time so that you can enjoy the rest of the afternoon in the sunshine. It's supposed to be a brilliant day. To begin with, I'd like to again thank Veridose for the reception sponsorship last night. Again, it was quite interesting to see everyone mingle. A last chance, perhaps, to say goodbye, share stories, anecdotes. And I'd like to indicate that the all-day or all-morning coffee is sponsored by Entrust Data Card. So we'll get right into it this morning on Session 7 on Border Control, Inspection Systems and Tools and Interoperable Applications. Jean Salomon will be our moderator this morning. And it's a real pleasure to welcome Jean to another TRIP symposium. Jean's background is particularly well suited for this look at inspection systems, as evidenced by his extensive 35-year career, which includes research in photo and radiochemistry as well as medical biophysics, European product line management, in medical imaging and hands-on experience in world leadership in the automation of transportation networks. And Jean is here this morning particularly as an expert for the International Standard Organization, ISO, and as CEO of the European Association for Biometrics. So again, Jean, nice to see you back and it's all yours. Thank you very much. Et voilà. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to start thanking the organizers, ICAO, um, and the Master of Ceremony for this kind introduction. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My goal is to make sure that uh, you benefit from the extensive uh, knowledge and capacity to build uh, the image of what the future should look like in the session seven on border control, inspection systems and tool and interoperable application. In, in a, in a couple of uh, words only, I think that you will have three opportunities to learn from three different type of environments, of stakeholders, and of ways to make sure to control. And you as delegate have the capacity or will be developing the capacity and have the mission to make sure that whatever investment is being made by your country in those systems is really controlled by you, your team, your government, your own stakeholders, so that in harmony, and we will review this uh, across the three presentations, in harmony, this develops into interoperability, into harmonized practices, better or best practices, biometrics being one portion of them, whether and to what extent it should or will or will not include standards, etc. I don't want to actually um, go ahead of myself, and I'd like to leave it to our three presenters this morning. So without further ado, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to do something which is uh, extremely difficult to introduce, as uh, Mr. Kiefer, Barry, an old friend, someone who taught me a lot of the things that I know, and hopefully will continue telling, uh, teaching me a couple of things I still don't know. So, uh, so Summary of professional experience of Barry is something kind of difficult, but I try to sum it up uh, by uh, one or two single words, virtually unlimited, or, or geared to excellence in three words. Now, to develop it a little bit, uh, he has, um, Barry has been a senior level executive with 30 years of uh, US government experience. He is the principal of his own consulting firm, Fall Hill Associated. His associate is also is, uh, serve as an adjunct professor at the James Monroe Professional and Graduate Center of the University of Mary Washington. He was prior to that managing director of Secure Document System. He worked also in the industry for Intergraph 
cooperation. He also served uh, at, uh, vice as uh, Vice President of Statistica International. And, and before that, he had a long career in the State Department uh, as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the Passport Services at the U.S. Department of State for 13 years. He is a regular chairman, moderator, and expert in ICAO work groups, the NTWG, the Working Group on New Technologies, and also an active member of ISO, the International Standards Organization. Now, he is very frequently recognized for outstanding services, and no wonder he was recognized in the TRIP Award for Excellence uh, for the continuum and the ongoing efforts that he has provided to deliver. Um, he holds, holds the degrees from uh, Dickinson College, the American University, and MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, an advanced degree in management and technology. Please, nothing could please me more than ask you, Barry, to give us the insight of uh, your presentation of today, which is uh, e-passport and modern inspection system, do it the right way. Barry, all yours. Oh, thank you very much, John. I'm delighted to be here with you again uh, this morning. And um, I would like to congratulate all of you that are here, sticking it out to the very last day, uh, the very last uh, uh, group of, uh, of presenters. Uh, very much appreciate uh, uh, your commitment. And uh, I hope that uh, what we have to say will be uh, uh, worthwhile uh, for the commitment that you've made. Um, I think it will be. Um, the, once I figure out the, uh, the comments that I want to make today um, are comments that I've made before. Um, they are comments that um, I feel very strongly about. Um, I was reluctant to effectively do the same presentation that I have done before, but I'm assured there's at least one or two of you there who have not seen this presentation, uh, so that'll make it all worthwhile. But frankly, um, and not to uh, sound uh, presumptuous about it, but um, I think this topic is important. I think the subject matter is important. I think the, uh, uh, the issues uh, are really pivotal uh, to what we're uh, all about, in great part why we're here at this symposium. Quick summary of um, what I intend to do. Uh, I think we all know that there have been uh, tremendous strides made over the past uh, 10 years or so in uh, the uh, design and um, uh, implementation of travel documents. Um, 9303 uh, has stood the test of time. Uh, and we've been building on 9303. Um, I think we've had um, very significant tangible results um, most recently. Um, I would um, go back to certainly the incorporation of um, OCRB initially as a very meaningful uh, step, the incorporation of a uh, digital photo uh, in the book and the uh, preclusion of um, uh, stick-on photos and of course then the inclusion of biometrics and RF chips. Uh, the RF chip specifically intended to uh, allow for the data for biometrics to be carried in a, in a paper document. I'm going to describe these efforts, uh, provide uh, hopefully an understanding how we've gotten where we are, and give you a bit of a um, perspective into the uh, work underway and uh, what the next generation of travel documents uh, will entail. It's intended 
for those of you who are considering e-passport implementation, and there are still a number of countries that have not yet done so, but I also am, con am, am addressing those of you who are considering implementing changes in your already existing programs. The issues, questions, points of, uh, of interest that I'm going to cover, I think apply to, uh, to all those who already have e-passports and those who are considering them. Just one footnote for you to uh, ponder. Uh, there is a, a substantial interest in making e-passport a global mandatory standard. It is not as yet, um, but there is strong interest in doing so. The last bullet on this summary slide, I think, uh, does in fact summarize the, um, uh, the thesis that I'm trying to impart. Um, and that is the, uh, the, the benefits of e-passport implementation as well as the requirements that are uh, in, intended to make sure that the E in the e-passport is carried out and that uh, the investment will use those, um, those um, factors. Uh, you heard a great deal uh, of um, implication in the opening, um, the opening discussions uh, that uh, there are uh, 67 members of the PKD, um, substantially uh, less than the 100 and, uh, I think it was 130 or so e-passport issuing authorities. And then when you look at the, uh, uh, the, the, the difference in terms of those countries that are actually using uh, the PKD and using the electronic uh, features of the e-passport, that's when uh, the situation gets a little scary. Uh, and that is, I think, uh, what I'm trying to uh, hit home, uh, being redundant perhaps, um, having uh, given this presentation before, but I think we can, um, I think it's the kind of thing that uh, we can't say too often. What I'm gonna do is cover um, a, uh, a list of threshold questions. These are questions for you. These are questions for you to answer for yourself, not for me, not for ICAO, uh, not for some uh, international organization, not for some uh, uh, external query. They're for you. Uh, questions that uh, you need to answer uh, from your own home perspective. Um, those questions are going to be, do you want an e-passport? Do you need an e-passport? Are you prepared to use an e-passport? Is the integrity of your current process consistent and complementary to the advances that you'll find in the e-passport program? Very, very important point. That's why I put integrity in uppercase letters. Last bullet here, um, I just want to make a point of this. Um, make everything as simple as possible, but not simpler. And I say that having seen a number of uh, approaches to border management and border inspection that in the interest of simplification has in great part lost the measures of, of security. Uh, the, uh, the confrontation of facilitation and security, the dilemma between the two need not be negative sum, um, uh, negative sum issues. They can complement each other. But we cannot throw one out in favor of the other. 
We need a balance. So now I go through the, um, the specific questions. Again, let me um, reiterate that um, these questions are for you. They're your questions for your systems. Um, so first and foremost, when you consider these questions, be honest. You have no one to fool, obviously, but yourself. So be honest uh, with your responses. Be honest with the consideration you give each of these questions. First question, do you want an e-passport system? Well, of course, says everybody. Um, and I think that's a reasonable response. We're very proud of the e-passport. We feel very strongly that it is uh, uh, a great advance um, in, in terms of uh, the, the strength that it represents. Uh, but what you need to do is have a comprehensive risk identification and management analysis of your present system. There are a number of countries at this point that are moving within the e-passport framework without having gone back to the integrity, if you will, of their own system, the system that issues those documents. Are you confident that your vulnerabilities are or will be identified and corrected so that you can take advantage of the e-passport and why is that e-passport useful to you, your country? Um, the answers are really going to be uh, dependent on your own situation and several of the follow-on questions that I'm going to bring up. The um, fact that everybody has vulnerabilities, every country, every issuing authority have vulnerabilities, some more than others, some more intense than others, uh, some from uh, different sources than others, but nevertheless, vulnerabilities exist universally. So look at those vulnerabilities. Look carefully at those vulnerabilities in your present system when you're considering the revision uh, for a new system that incorporates an e-passport. Do you need an e-passport system. Um, a while back, I was in uh, one, uh, one country uh, that was in the midst of um, tendering for an e-passport system. And I talked to uh, a number of officials in that government um, trying to find out the answer to this question from their perspective. Do you need an e-passport system? Why are you implementing an e-passport system? The answer that I got was the president said we want one. Uh, that country uh, spent a lot of money uh, implementing an e-passport system. Um, to this day, it's not being used. So um, that's unfortunate. What does the E do for you that a traditional machine-readable passport can't? Um, I think the answer to that is obvious. However, getting down to the details of making that happen seems to be elusive for a number of countries in terms of using the E. There are economies of scale that result from the uh, use of an e-passport. Uh, the machinery and the infrastructure that accompany e-passport implementations um, are extremely agile, uh, deal with large volumes, um, and deal with them uh, in a very uh, quick, fast, efficient way. Um, this implies that you may uh, want to consider changes in your infrastructure, changes in your issuance uh, system, the number of, um, of uh, receiving uh, application centers you have, the number of uh, passport personalization centers you have, 
And uh, in, in fact, what a number of countries have concluded and done, changing the uh, delivery system of those passports. Also, I want to make a point. Don't forget the impact on overseas issuance. Um, it's a very rare country that can afford to uh, deploy e-passport hardware, software, infrastructure um, at all of their embassies and consulates uh, overseas. So make sure that you uh, consider uh, the overseas issuance and in that regard, the methodology for, uh, for delivering those passports. Last bullet on here is really a um, kind of a, a, a compendium. Is your border management procedure and process equipped to deal with and in bold uh, italicized letters properly inspecting an e-passport? Crucial question. You, you see the threads here. There are several questions that are getting to that same uh, issue of using the e-passport. <coughs> which is the next question. Are you prepared to use the e-passport? Are your inspection systems ready at this point? Probably um, to a certain extent, the answer is yes. However, that means that you must harness up the, um, what often is the, uh, uh, the divide between uh, the, the entity within your government that inspects and the entity within your government that issues. Um, country after country after country that I've been to, um, often they do not connect. In fact, I had an occasion a while back where uh, I went to a country. Um, we had uh, four days of very, very fine meetings with the issuers and the inspectors in the same room at the same time, they actually gave me an award thanking me because they had never sat down together before to talk about this stuff. So um, very important to bring together your inspection and, and issuance uh, uh, entities. Uh, obviously, one must feed onto the other. Question that came, uh, this question uh, next uh, is an issue that came up several times in our uh, introductory uh, uh, presentations. Are you going to join the PKD um, and have you taken appropriate budget precautions? Um, the budget process in, in the government, most governments, most all governments, is a very um, complex, convoluted, Byzantine, uh, and I could go on with all sorts of adjectives, but a budget process that you have to contend with where you need lead time. You have to put into your budget request uh, that which you're going to need two or three years hence. Uh, be sure that if you're developing an e-passport, when you develop the funding for the e-passport, budget for the e-passport, be sure that you also include money for the PKD. The, um, my favorite analogy really, and, and I'll, uh, some of you have heard me say this before, but my favorite analogy of the PKD is uh, likened to um, a very fancy sports car. Um, wonderful engineering. Uh, lovely to look at, uh, tremendous uh, capability. So when you buy that lovely sports car and you say, well, I think I'll just pass on buying the wheels for that sports car, um, you're not going to get very far with that sports car without the wheels. The same as your investment in an e-passport. You're not going to be able to realize its true potential without proper inspection. Final bullet that I, on this slide that I want to mention, um, 
preparing the traveling public. Uh, these systems, these e-passport these e systems, change. They make changes. And people uh, generally, across the board, um, have a bit of a difficulty in accepting changes, especially those that they don't understand. Uh, when you're introducing um, uh, fingerprints, when you're introducing uh, uh, photo capture and comparison, um, the, the impact on your traveling public is significant. Make sure they understand fully what this process is, what it's intended to do, and especially what biometrics will do for them, not to them. Very important slide, this one. Your overall system integrity. Is yours enough? I am um, extremely um, strident about recommending e-passports universally. I am not, um, at this point, prepared to say this should be mandatory. Uh, that depends on the answers to all these questions. But I am, I am uh, certainly um, extremely um, appreciative of what the e-passport can do for the world. Uh, but many countries do not have a system whose integrity of issuance is consonant with the ability and trust that's implied by the uh, e-passport. The um, your current issuance and handling process really must be looked very carefully at, very carefully. Um, very few issuance systems that I've seen, and I've seen many issuance systems over the years, very few of them cannot benefit from uh, uh, change um, and incorporation of uh, risk management, recognition of risk, and facing up to risk. The um, next bullet, evidence of identity. Very important. It's something that um, uh, certainly ICAO has been uh, seized with for uh, quite some time. You'll find um, in uh, uh, 9303, you'll find uh, some guidance on evidence of identity. Um, we've had a lot of, um, of seminars, workshops with ICAO, OSCE, uh, o OAS, others, IOM. Invariably, the group there, and this is a group of, uh, of people who have to uh, make these things happen, invariably, the weakest link identified, and that's their term, by the way, is weakest link, the weakest link identified in that uh, continuum is the evidence of identity. Doesn't, uh, doesn't do much good if you issue uh, a delightful, uh, a, a very, very impressive passport document around which that identity has not been vetted to its fullest. Have you um, effected changes to ensure uh, that you're going to respect personal privacy? You're gathering a lot of data, a lot of data that um, people are suspicious about. What are you going to do with these fingerprints? Um, just recognize that uh, the, the traveling public um, has enough on its mind when they make a trip that you want to make sure that they don't concern themselves with is that information going to be uh, used for other kinds of purposes. Have your human resource issues been thoroughly addressed? Very, very critical for you to consider this. The, um, I, I ran a, a large uh, passport system and certainly found that uh, the greatest strength that I had was my staff. 
I found also that the greatest weakness was my staff. Um, the, uh, the, the pivotal importance of the people in your systems uh, cannot be uh, uh, overstated. Do you comply with the letter as well as the spirit of 9303? That is facilitation and security. Not facilitation or security, but and. Have you examined overseas issuance? I mentioned that earlier. Look at it very carefully because um, in great part, overseas issuance and emergency uh, travel documents, the last bullet, uh, frequently are among the, um, uh, the most um, uh, the, the most porous of uh, aspects of a system that allow fraudsters to uh, get away with things that they shouldn't be allowed to. The measures of integrity. Human systems, zero tolerance. That sounds good, zero tolerance. Um, however, I've been around the block uh, in my time in dealing with um, governments, dealing with uh, border management, dealing with uh, document issuance systems. And the, um, uh, the idea of zero tolerance in many cultures simply is not going to work. The, um, the, 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 the tolerance of certain kinds of um, uh, malfeasance, nonfeasance, is uh, certainly to be acknowledged. The um, remaining uh, measures of integrity speak for themselves. Um, the um, next bullet, next slide, evidence of identity really needs to have its own slide to be, um, to be appropriate, uh, to be uh, fully uh, cognizant. And the last slide, my time is running out. Uh, some measures of, um, of concern uh, that we need to be uh, cognizant of. And with that, I'll close this uh, session. My time is uh, way up. And I thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Larry. It's, whoops, apologies. You take your time. First and only comment would be that uh, very rarely have I seen so much delivered in so few or limited number of slides. I think this is really something, it's actually a compendium of expertise put in a dozen of slides, actually less than that. Uh, much more to learn and anything could be uh, handled. Uh, if we have time, uh, there would be a question addressed maybe by the audience. Uh, I remind you that I'll be uh, receiving on, on behalf of the panel questions if you have uh, the will to do so to trip symposium, uh, symposium sorry one word at iko.int feel free to do that meanwhile thanking again uh, barry for this uh, presentation i would like to move on to the uh, second of uh, the presenter of this morning i'm going to i'm going to ask uh, madame esther fernandez crespo who is responsible for the spanish pkd uh, uh, to talk to us about data processing uh, and the systematic uh, use, I'm sorry, <laughs> to talk to us about the uh, IKO PKD in the Spanish PKD environments. Sorry about that. I'll please Esther, meanwhile, proceed. And I would like to lead, read a little bit beforehand about your presentation uh, and the bio that you have uh, 
provided to us. She, Maria is actually a sub-inspector of uh, Spanish National Police. She has completed several studies related to information technology and communications. And she has devoted herself since 2012 to the area of IT in the National Spanish Police. She has been in charge of SPOC, the single point of contact, and an NPKD, the National PKD system, for five years now. Amongst others, she is also the Spanish representative on the Article 6 of the European Union. And nowadays, as I said before, she is the vice chair of the ICAO PKD. Please, the floor is yours, Maria Esther. Hello, first of all, saying that I'm going to do my presentation in Spanish. If you take, if you want to take all of you the headphones for translation, that will be great. Buenos dias a todos. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much uh, to the moderator. Thank you very much to ICAO for once again giving us the opportunity to be with you. I know it's Friday, it's the last day of the symposium, and we have been lucky enough to hear some excellent presentations and very interesting sessions. And so I'm going to try to uh, keep mine short and hopefully useful. As uh, most of you already know, the uh, National uh, uh, NPKD is a uh, storage uh, system uh, uh, managed by the signing authority and uh, the uh, uh, national police. Uh, this is a central system that uh, allows us to uh, validate passports. As has been said uh, all week, uh, that passport uh, validation through the ICAO PKD is uh, key to capitalizing on all of the investments that all of you, all of your states have made in uh, issuing passports. It contributes to uh, border security and facilitation, and it's a method of uh, counterterrorism and uh, crime fighting, and we want to make sure that passengers are safer everywhere in the world. As you can see on the screen, the aim of this uh, presentation is to uh, show you the new version of the Spanish NPKD, uh, show that we are adapting to new international regulations, and just talk about uh, the new features uh, for improving the management of uh, cryptographic uh, material. And we make sure that uh, all the material is compliant with the uh, ICAO document 9303. As more and more states uh, are issuing uh, e-passports, uh, the uh, interchange of uh, certificates uh, which are necessary for uh, validating passports is getting more compl complicated and there might be mistakes. And uh, I must say time and again, this is so important that uh, if uh, the CCCA certificates are not uh, exchanged, as we heard uh, yesterday and all week, then uh, the public part of the uh, certificates and the e-passport to just become paper passports. And that means that the border authorities uh, can't trust e-passports and the passengers themselves might have uh, problems at the border. And if any of you uh, don't trust uh, Spain and its CSCAs, then our citizens are going to have problems at the uh, borders. Their passports can't be verified. For that reason, in 2012, Spain decided to join the ICAO PKD. And uh, introduce a national public key system that uh, allows us to connect to the ICAO system. In Spain, we uh, have introduced Key One. It's uh, software that is very comprehensive. It's among the most comprehensive in the world, and it allows us to manage all certificates in a secure and uh, uh, trust-based way. The NPKD of our country uh, uh, allows us to uh, check passports uh, in a simple fashion. It has cryptographic material. 
uh, in line with ICAO system and it helps us uh, manage uh, increase in passenger throughput and it uh, covers all the different uh, inspection uh, types uh, that exist around the world. Today there are more than one million e-passports circulating around the world and uh, about 135, 145 countries are issuing e-passports. So now I'd like to tell you how our NPKD works in Spain. If you, you've seen our country, you, you know that uh, all people entering in Spain have to get their passports checked, and for that we need to have uh, the full certification chain. The passports are checked uh, and against the uh, signing uh, certificate. of the issuing country. And the two certificates uh, cannot uh, be on the current uh, revocation list. All of the cryptographic material has to uh, be in the inspection system. So what does our NPKD do? It connects to the ICAO PKD. It uh, downloads all of the necessary material for checking passports and the operator following uh, verification introduces uh, that data and uh, sends it to the uh, inspection and validation systems. This system makes it uh, possible to create a master list, as you all know. This is a list of certificates that uh, helps us to check all passports around the world. Here there are the various uh, functions of the system. It's a very user-friendly software. Here you see all of the uh, CCAs, uh, the uh, master lists. We have a search function uh, that works by country or expiry date. We can also import CCAs, and they uh, are the root CCAs that uh, help us to validate the uh, master lists and uh, revocation lists. And once the approved CSEAs uh, are introduced, then we can import the uh, CRLs, the DSs, and the master lists. We can also uh, issue master lists and approved and validated CSEAs. We can uh, process uh, uh, ICAO uh, LDS with uh, all of our cryptographic uh, equipment, and we can uh, uh, upload all the material. Now I'm going to uh, tell you something that you already know about document uh, 9303 of ICAO. This uh, document, uh, part 12, specifies all of the requirements and uh, profiles of the CSEA uh, link uh, certificates and master lists have to meet for the PKIs of each country that uh, issues passports. ICAO has uh, published this uh, document. It's a basic reference and it uh, complies with ISO standards. And now I'm going to say a word about the new features of the latest uh, version of our NPKD. When we import uh, all of the cryptographic material into the system, the operator can enable the system to do uh, the checks as per uh, document 9303. Once uh, it's imported, we have a report on all of the checks that do not uh, comply with 9303, and the operator will have to accept or reject uh, the certificates. As you can see, we have a lot of information on any possible errors when it comes to validating passports at to the borders. And uh, this uh, information is of vital importance to all border agents. We also have new web services uh, that uh, give us the CSEAs, DSs, CRLSs, and 
unexpired uh, documents. So uh, we uh, are able to process all this uh, indiscriminately. And one last feature I want to tell you about is uh, that we can issue a master list in accordance with the uh, validation threshold. And that means that uh, if our system is connected to a web service uh, with a Spanish and PKD, then a passport can be, uh, the CSCA can be validated and included in the master list. This uh, validation threshold can be managed by the operator. If uh, Spain takes in passengers from uh, Morocco uh, and the Bahamas, uh, we have to configure the system appropriately. We need to be able to uh, introduce the CSEA uh, certificates into the master list. So every time we issue a master list, then it will be uh, made up of validated approved CSEAs that have uh, passed the validation threshold. And here you see the uh, whole of the uh, inspection system, all of the certificates that are introduced. It's updated with all of the CSEAs published in the IKO master list, with, uh, in addition to all the bilaterally exchanged CSEAs and from other uh, sources. So we have about uh, 400 uh, CSEAs, 130 uh, links. And uh, I hope that was useful. I'd like to conclude by once again thanking ICAO for uh, the opportunity to present, including uh, uh, our colleagues who presented uh, our national ID card. Uh, and uh, we are very proud of our achievements in that and in PKD. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate. And as a vice chair of the ICAO PKD, I would like to highlight how important it is uh, to join our organization so that uh, we can exchange all of these CSEAs. It's uh, extremely important to uh, share CSEAs. We need them. And if you're part of the PKD, then the exchange will be very simple, secure, and it will ensure interoperability among countries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, excellent presentation. This is, um, a, as a second speaker, we are actually adopting the same delivery line as Barry used before. You, here you have an example of a strong will and a strong delivery process of the service of the PKD, the national PKD being an example. And what I think is most important is that because this has been strongly adopted by Spain and because of the proximity, obvious proximity of, uh, of the NPKD with the uh, central PKD relationship because of uh, capabilities, I think that the only missing elements, if any, is your presence in the PKD. But not only being members and being subscribing to the services, it's also feeding the PKD of the data. As you probably remember from yesterday's, one of the key issues there is that the data quality of the tests that can be performed by each of the national system, you want to have the true revocation list of those countries. And remember the example that was given by a small country, Liechtenstein, if I remember properly, by delivering information about the weakness or about a revocation list, there's nothing wrong, at the contrary. So the point is that not only subscribing to the PKD, it is mutualizing the capacity of welcoming people from a country to a country. After all, we are all part of the same ecosystem of tourism, business oriented, which by definition means exchanging between countries. So there's nothing more natural than exchanging the capacity to assess the risk via the capacity, for example, to have an updated value, an updated list, an updated master list, of course, but an updated revocation list of all the certificates. That's the key to succeed in further harmonizations, which I think we'll review, time permits, at the very, very end. Now, I'd like 
thanking you again, I I'd like to ask our uh, third speaker and, and talk to you a little bit about, uh, about uh, um, her, about Maria Tibulka. Here we are going to talk again about a different subject, but very closely related. How do you implement harmonization, this time between different stakeholders which complement each other, I will believe. Now, um, Maria Tibulka is uh, the Information and Business Product Manager and the General Secretary at the General Secretariat of Interpol, and she's going to talk to us about the systematic use of API screening versus SLTD. Now, she's currently the lead uh, of uh, the Stolen and Lost Travel Document Database, the SLTD at Interpol, which is one of the major components of the organization's border management application. For the last seven years, she was involved in the Interpol Border Security Initiative, assisting Interpol's member countries in enhancing their border screening. She is holding a master's degree in um, management of public institutions and a bachelor's degree in both public law and computer science. She has 20 years professional experience with police services with a deep insight on the various process steps from document issuance, machine readable travel documents, criminal intelligence gathering and analysis to global and interoperable applications for identification management. She participated in a variety of United Nations and the European Union missions which helped her gaining knowledge of various particularities related to border management. She was awarded various medal and certificate for excellence for her activity. Maria, the floor is yours this time. Distinguished audience, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, ICAO, for inviting Interpol for this uh, trip um, symposium, this very interesting event. Uh, to be noted that uh, Interpol is a uh, committed DKIO partner uh, with uh, TRIP strategy and uh, with regards uh, border security. My intervention today, it will be about connecting the Interpol and national API systems for enhanced uh, security. In the last two decades, countries which, with the world's most advanced border security, have embraced the concept of virtual border, characterized by the advanced use of actionable information, actionable information. Interoperable database risk analyzes the sharing of advanced passenger information for extensive pre-screening to their great benefit. This concept has been a paradigm shift compared to the historical viewpoint of the national border as a fixed physical line. Border management in the virtual environment has advanced significantly from the geographical border line, both in space and time. Border management is now designed to operate far beyond national boundaries and the time component of border management has also been extended, encompassing the entire preemptive review processes of assessing security risk against data, preventing potential threats prior to arrival, demarcating lines long before a recognizable border is reached. API and PNR are seen as a key element for effective implementation of the virtual, virtual border. In the virtual border environment, the, the advanced passenger information API and the passenger name records PNR systems are critical. Both anticipated the virtual border as initially introduced at the end of the 80s to facilitate the clearance of arriving passengers at major, major international airports. From a border security perspective, the API system, which captures travelers' biographical information contained in the machine-readable zone of a passport during airline check-in, enables an effective evidence-based traveler risk assessment and screening system for immigration processing, security, and custom purposes. PNR is typically contained with an airline reservation system and is not considered as 
so-called verified because it's not collected and stored at the time of and then subsequent to the original booking. PNR data can be used to identify an individual and it is typically used for risk-based assessment of individuals about whom other information may not be available. For these reasons, it is more valuable in the identification of suspicious trends, relationship and travel patterns. However, if API and PNR data are not systematically checked for incoming and outgoing travelers against national and international watch lists, including the relevant Interpol databases, that should be routinely utilized when screening passenger. The utility as tool for identifying criminals and terrorists is severely compromised. Interpol interdiction operation at border points around the world prove very often that fugitive terrorists and other known criminals are traversing air, land and sea border without detections in countries that are not systematically screened their traveler against Interpol's databases. In this context, the United uh, Nations uh, Resolution 2178 uh, that calls member countries upon uh, and uh, required airlines to operate uh, uh, in their territory to provide advanced uh, passenger information. Also, it's uh, calling um, Slide. So the same resolution 2178 is uh, acknowledge Interpol capability to address the threat posed by foreign terrorist fighter, including through um, global law enforcement information sharing enabled by the use in uh, secure communication network, I-24-7, the databases and system of advisory notices, procedures to track stolen forge identities, papers and travel document and Interpol counterterrorism uh, fora and foreign terrorist fighter program. Interpol is acting as an enable for API PNR world, world, uh, worldwide through a range of operational tools, is fully committed to fight travel identity uh, document misuse globally. This commitment has a long history. Interpol's dedication to prevent travel and identity document misuse dates back nearly 100 years when efforts against travel document falsification were recognized in a resolution of the first International Police uh, Criminal Police Commission in uh, 1923. And by 1930, specialized units has been established to deal with criminal records, currency counterfeiting, and uh, passport forgery. Central to these efforts, it's Interpol Stolen and Lost Travel Documents uh, Database. Launched in 2002, it is the wake of the 5-11 terror attack in the United States. The SLTD database is only the only global repository of travel and identity documents which has been reported as stolen, lost, revoked, invalidated or stolen blank. It is a proof that stolen blank documents was used by the terrorists, was personalized and used by the terrorists in the terrorist attacks in uh, 2015 in, uh, in Paris, as well in, uh, in Brussels. Uh, currently, there are more than 86 millions of, uh, of stolen um, or lost travel documents in, uh, in circulation. I quote here the importance of uh, SLTD and uh, systematically checked against the API as, uh, as well. Um, uh, I quote uh, a remark from the um, uh, report of uh, um, investigation of the 9-11 attack for terrorists. Uh, um, the travel documents are important as weapons. By developing the SLTD, Interpol provides 
its partner agencies and member countries with the ability to exchange data on fraudulent travel document both globally and securely using our secure communication network uh, I-24-7. One of the value added uh, by uh, Interpol SLTD to global security is uh, the possibility to be fully and easily integrated to the national police and border management system, including national API PNR platform. This is critical that the implementation of the national API PNR uh, system to be coupled with implementation of integrated access to all uh, of Interpol policing capabilities, uh, which include uh, SLTD. So this is what we are recommending. Whenever you are uh, you are having your national API PNR platform, it, it's good to uh, to consider the integration of uh, Interpol policing uh, capabilities uh, for uh, for making the uh, the, the checks. SLTD as means for checking uh, API, so persons seeking to utilize lost, stolen, or revoked documents uh, and uh, for facilitating their illicit traffic may be easier identified uh, prior to travel where uh, the receiving government compares uh, the document information contained in the API system uh, with the uh, Interpol SLTD uh, database. If you look at the set of, uh, of the API data elements, uh, in red, you will see the, the, the data that uh, can be checked against uh, Interpol SLTD, meaning to say the document identification number, the issuing state organization, and uh, the, the type of document, either passport, identity, or, um, or visa in, in some, uh, some case. Uh, Interpol supports the single window concept, which would ensure that API PNR information is not transmitted to different agencies within a country in different formats, thereby reducing the risk of miscommunication, the cost of compliance, and the potential impact on the airline's industry. In addition, we strongly recommend that the Interpol National Central Bureau in each country to collaborate um, closely with the, on policy and uh, technical API uh, PNR matters with uh, all uh, API uh, PNR uh, national uh, stakeholders in order to enhance security communication between national units in charge of API PNR, such as Passenger Information Unit or uh, National uh, Detection Center, how it's called in some countries, and their access to Interpol uh, system. Only by uh, assigning the NCB with clear responsibility in the national API uh, PNR system management can be systematically and automatically screening of all passengers and documents against the nominal and uh, SLTD, uh, not only SLTD, but also travel documents associated with NOSIS uh, database. Uh, this can be achieved only by cooperating and uh, involving uh, the National Central Bureau uh, within uh, the process of uh, integrating uh, in uh, national API uh, PNR uh, system uh, that you are developing. This is especially important in countries which do not have strong relation between agencies, infrastructure in place, or secure government email accounts. Inclusion of the NCB representative in the interagency uh, passenger information unit or a national detection center would be a significant access with, within those offices to ensure timely and accurate international communication with the possibility of assistance by the Interpol General Secretariat. In terms of technical standardization, Interpol strongly supports API standards, UN Edifact Pax Lease, and recommends their use in the development of standardized and harmonized system. For the past 15 years, Interpol has offering te technical solutions to its member countries, such as FIND, Fixed Interpol Network Database, which is a web service-based solution technology that connects national and border management system with, um, <coughs> with Interpol databases and is providing full interoperability for screening traveler at the border. 
Such integrated solutions allow immigration and border security officers to automatically search against national, regional, and Interpol databases having one single query and uh, uh, different responses from, uh, from various databases. From the time of a travel document is scanned, Interpol system provides the response in an average of less of two seconds for, uh, for the query. Uh, to support this, the Interpol Secure Cloud infrastructure provides a robust and global arch architecture tank thanks to its multiple data centers around the world, offering high availability, av availability around the clock with strong service level agreements for such mission critical border security application. Using the same technology as described, through the full integration of FIND within national API PNR systems, Interpol is also encouraging the interactive uh, API, IAPI mechanism, which enables two-way real-time communication on a passenger-by-passenger -passenger transaction basis initiated during check-in and allows government to issue board or do not board responses to airline companies in real time. Of the approximately 100 countries which have extended access to Interpol SLTD database to their border, generating close to 20 million searches every day against Interpol database from the front line, several countries have already been conducted, advanced checked, through their national API PNR system for years. What we are, the call is here to encourage country more and more to integrate uh, within their API uh, system uh, the um, interoperability with uh, Interpol databases. What is important is the operational standardization because the technical, technological achievement of integration of uh, access to Interpol nominal SLTD and TDON databases into API PNR system is just one step to success. For real-time checks at the border, it is equally important for countries to use this technology effectively by implementing corresponding nationally operating standard operating policies and procedure where they will define uh, each uh, national entity roles and uh, responsibility within, uh, within the process. Uh, that will ensure an accurate API data processing flow and appropriate process management of positive uh, alerts, matches, or hits, how we'll call it. The use of detailed and effective national standard operating procedure is vital to ensuring that the management of database his, hits, responses is rapid, accurate, and appropriate, and all stakeholder agencies within a member countries have a clear understanding of their roles and responsibilities within the process. In our efforts to To remain relevant with our databases, which are quite unique if we consider SLTD and the nominals as well, we, we are doing efforts for maintaining uh, Interpol database uh, relevance because there is a recognized need uh, for Interpol to maintain the high, highest credibility of its databases. In this respect, the organization, along with implementing and facilitating integrated solution for systematic API checks against its database, also continues urging its member countries to update the databases in a systematically and timely manner. We offering a lot of various solution for this, and uh, for SLTD, for example, we do have the web services solution, which is called Wisdom, for managing national SLTD travel document uh, to, to be reported in uh, Interpol SLTD. And for our Interpol system of notices, we do have an iLink application uh, for managing the exchange of police information and international uh, cooperation uh, uh, request. And finally, if we discuss about privacy and data protection, um, 
it's well known that the establishment of the API system finds its legal roots within the Chicago Convention, which sets forth internationally recognized standards and obligations for ICAO member countries. National API systems are also subject to domestic legislation within individual countries. When national authorities receiving API data process them through Interpol information system to query against Interpol databases, such processing is governed by Interpol's rules of processing the data, RPD. The RPD established common data processing requirements for Interpol's member countries in line with international privacy and data protection uh, standards. The Commission for the Control of Interpol Files, CCF, is an independent and impartial body and uh, is responsible for ensuring that the processing of personal data by the Interpol General Secretariat uh, conforms to the apl applicable Interpol uh, rules. The applicability of the um, uh, rules of processing data to API, data check against Interpol databases, including SLTD, guarantees individuals that their personal data shared with airlines will be treated with due respect for their rights, including their rights to privacy and uh, data protection. So that concludes my presentation. Uh, I would like to take the opportunity for, um, for being here to present uh, two projects that Interpol is involved in. It's, uh, one is called the Project IDEA, Interpol Database Enhanced Access. Um, this is a project funded by the European Commission for two years period. It started on 1st of February 2019 and uh, is targeting uh, the European member countries. And uh, it envisages as main activities the enhancement of IT products and infrastructure in uh, EU member countries through implementation of wisdom, the, the technology that I told you for uh, up-to-date and accurate information to be recorded in SLTD, uh, and latest version of FIND. FIND is the solution to query the, the databases at, uh, at the border, easy to interoperable with the national uh, border uh, control system. Uh, also, another activity will be to develop standards, guidelines, and standard operating procedure related uh, to SLTD. Uh, and um, <clears throat> we will organize also SLTD advisory group meetings and best exchange uh, programs. Uh, we would like to thank here for ICAO implication uh, in, uh, in this project and uh, thank you for, um, it's really appreciated your support in uh, assisting us. And um, <clears throat> what we are expecting, uh, we are expecting increased population and systematic use of Interpol databases for, uh, for border. Um, updated uh, SLTD um, international and national uh, standard operating procedure. And one of the main activities, uh, we would like to reduce the administrative hits. And here, I, I would like to throw the ball to you and to, to give some reflection on the things, how can, can we do that? By administrative hits, we are, um, we meant uh, the, the travelers that they declare their documents lost or stolen, and after that, they are attempting to, to travel with it. So that for us is a hit, but it's a hit that it's, it's a false one. So uh, we, will, um, <clears throat> we would need uh, all the support that we can get for um, the public awareness campaign that we are working uh, with uh, uh, for reducing uh, these uh, administrative hits. So uh, feel free to, to contact me and if you have any thoughts or just uh, drop a line, uh, any idea we, we can get on that and we hope that uh, ICAO can help us through the facilitation section um, with, um, with our activities here because it's recognized and it's not only in Europe because this project indeed is, uh, is concerning uh, the European countries but uh, it's also considering that 80% of the hits and the traveler that are coming to Europe are from the third countries. So uh, if we can do something at the global level, that will, will, will be a, a great uh, achievement.
And finally, I don't know if you had already the chance to see that there is a boot, boot 29. Uh, there is a joint initiative um, project fields, joint initiative uh, Interpol and Frontex. Uh, project fields funded by Frontex and developed it jointly with uh, them represents the first important attempt to combine the respective values of two organizations, namely Frontex, Quick Check Card, and Interpol Dial Dog Database, in a technical solution specifically studied for the first line border police. The purpose of the project is to provide real time information on fraudulent travel documents directly on the screen used by the first line police border police. Frontex has recently developed a new product called Quick Check Card. It's a decision ad supporting travel and identity document authentication, showing the key detection points of a single document with images taken from its specimen or authentic version of the same document, selected based on the most recent known forgery trends and modus operandi, as well as upon technical specification of the document, targeting its vulnerability. In the framework of the project, Frontex was connected to DialDoc via I-247, and the quick check card are currently uploaded into Interpol DialDoc databases in compliance with the European Union rules and data sharing. In the framework of the project, fields, the DialDoc database will be completed, redesigned, and renamed as field, fields. The new field solutions, solution, one is integrated within the national database, national border management system, will be distributing the front, Frontex Quick Check Card, so effectively implement an additional security layer at the border. Yeah, yeah, I have. Uh, the project is currently in its third and conclusive phase, the technical development and testing phase with some 14 countries. And if you need more information about the project, the Boots is already there, Boots 29, and uh, you, my colleagues, will uh, gladly uh, offer you more information. Thank you very much for your attention, and I will gladly take any advice from you regarding the campaign on administrative hits. And also, if you have any, any other questions, I will gladly uh, answer to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. Uh, I have a couple of uh, seconds to conclude, and if I may ask you for just, in retrospect, what did we learn? We actually learned my own three conclusions. A call for patience, a call for responsiveness, and a call for action. When we move from, during this hour, hour and a half, from documents with uh, Barry, to inspection system with the PKD, and to the advantage of working cohesively with uh, matchmaking between stakeholders, very important in the overall security, we actually are accom we ac accomplished, hopefully, within an hour and a half what you are requested as delegates to be doing in a couple of years, hence my call for patience. The second point is call for responsiveness. As much as it took years to move from 700 millions of passports to over a billion of e-passports that are actually now starting to reap the benefits of the PKD, by the same token, the responsiveness is also something that we uh, anticipate from you delegates in your own country, in your national system, to embrace the change. And the call for action is actually to rely on existing substrates, the uh, standards, the academia, your own stakeholders, and to the extent that there are standards or there are evolving standards as far as touchy subjects are concerned, biometrics, morphing of yesterday and other challenges of tomorrow, there are instances, there are national bodies to which some of you colleagues or yourself in your own countries could contribute to. And for those who need details, please feel free to come to me and to other experts in this, and we will be able to help you. 
once again, thank you for your time. As far as I'm concerned, as moderator, but most of all, thanks very much to this panel for their exquisite delivery. Thank you. And thanks to you, Jean, for handling this in such a masterful way as usual. Thank you. It's a good round of applause for everyone again. Okay, we're now very ready for a good coffee break. It's the last one. So enjoy it. And we'll see you in about 20, 25 minutes. We'll ring the bell anyway. Okay, thank you. Enjoy. <laughs>